Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Adam Warski, and uh, I would like to talk about how to do transactional event sourcing using Flick. Okay, so uh, the organizers asked uh, you to uh, vote on the sessions. So after this session is uh, complete, all you have to do is you, go, you have to go to the mobile app and click the green uh, face that you like the session. Um, there will be a reminder at the end as well, so don't worry. Um, okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's start with actually defining what, uh, what is event sourcing. I guess most of you have some kind of idea what, uh, what can it mean. There's a lot of articles on the web uh, by people such as Martin Fowler or Greg Young, which probably explain this a lot uh, better than me. So for the purposes of, the pre of this presentation, um, Let's say that event sourcing is when all changes in the system are captured as a sequence of events. And these events are our primary source of knowledge. So the events come first in the system and everything else is derived as a consequence of these events. So we focus on the events on, what, uh, on, on, a, on a description of what happens in, in, uh, in the system. It doesn't have to be strictly a sequence, but here it, uh, let's... Um, but it, uh, it usually is. So why should we uh, be bothered with event sourcing? So there's many reasons. Um, one of them is that we work in IT, and IT is information technology. So it's something to do with information, right? Um, and when using event sourcing, we are not uh, losing any information, or we are losing much less information than in uh, let's say, more traditional CRUD system, right? In a CRUD system, every time we remove, we update an existing uh, piece of data, we lose the old information, right? Uh, we also lose the information on when the change was done and so on, okay? So uh, just because we work in IT, it is already a good reason to use event sourcing because we don't lose this additional information. Another thing is that using event sourcing, you get an audit log of what happened in the system, kind of for free. So, you know, using a new shiny web framework, while attractive, doesn't really bring any business value quite often. Here, using event sourcing, you can actually bring business value to the project. Even when a project is starting and there's no requirement yet to do an audit log, it quite often comes in later, and then you can say it's, it's already done. Uh, also for testing and for debugging, you have the possibility to, to recreate the system state at any point in time uh, by replaying the events up to a certain point. Uh, there are also some other benefits which, uh, which I won't mention here, but I guess these are the, the main ones, at least for, at least for me. And uh, throughout this talk, I will, uh, will quite often uh, reference like uh, what I say, more traditional CRUD systems. So we will uh, show things in contrast to CRUD systems uh, where you like uh, typically have uh, some entities and you create, read, update, and delete them, right? And we will see how we can do things differently uh, using event sourcing. Um, so it's not my first approach to audit logs. Um, I think I thought that I was going to shock you all by showing Hibernate on a Scala conference, but actually Martin already did that. Yesterday he did mention Hibernate, um, so no surprise here, but I did work on a project called Hibernate Inverse. It was an extension uh, to Hibernate, and, but it uh, kind of worked the other way. So uh, with Inverse, every time you modified an entity, an entry with the old data was written to an audit table. So <clears throat> in Inverse, like the history was, was written after the changes, and here like the history comes first and we derive the current state from it. And continuing the subject of me, just to uh, introduce myself a bit, um, I'm a co-founder and a developer at Software Mill, which is a distributed software house based in Poland, but we operate on the whole world. We are a light band consulting partner. We mainly do Scala, uh, also Java, and you know, big data, enormous data, and so on. Uh, we do some open source projects uh, like Macquire, uh, Elastic MQ Bootzuka, I have a blog and a Twitter account, feel invited. Uh, as a company, we also do a Scala newsletter, Scala Times, and maybe you've heard of it. If you haven't, uh, check it out. It's a weekly, uh, weekly set of Scala news. 
and the Scala conference in Poland. If you ever come to Poland, please feel invited. Okay, so what's, uh, what's our goal? Uh, so our goal is to get the benefits of event sourcing, as I mentioned on the previous slides, but still be able to leverage the various features that a, rela a re relational database gives us. For example, we want to be able to use transactions. Transactions give us some nice properties, like it's easier to maintain consistency, for example. <clears throat> we want to be able to use the quite rich schema language to describe how our data can look. Uh, but most of all, we want to be able to use SQL data to query our current data. Okay? SQL can be used by, uh, not only by programmers, but quite often by analysts, for example, and we still want to maintain that. Uh, so we still want to be able to have our data queryable using SQL. Um, also, I think that, uh, especially in the microservices era, uh, you know, where each microservice can have its own database, uh, I think it even more often than, than, uh, than before, it, may, it might be that the best fit for a certain microservice would be a relational database, not a NoSQL database. Okay, so there are <clears throat> quite a lot of other approaches to event sourcing. Uh, they might be more scalable, uh, more, fault to more fault tolerant. <clears throat> they might be able to process uh, uh, a higher number of events per second, for example, and so on. But of course, you, you don't always need that, uh, so that's why you have the choice, right? Uh, so uh, the, the trade-off here that we will have the convenience of transactions and the convenience of SQL, uh, while they, uh, they can handle probably more data. But on the other hand, the, these, uh, these solutions listed here, they are all um, eventually consistent, right? Event store is an eventually consistent database where events are the uh, first class construct. ACA persistence uh, uses, well, it can use many data stores, but most often it's Cassandra. Uh, Eventuate is a, a distributed event store as well. Okay, so how will our events uh, look like? So, first of all, an event states something about what happened in the past, okay? So it's something that already happened. For example, a uh, user created can be a, an, an event or a, pro, or a product ordered. So uh, an event states what already happened. It's an immutable fact, right? We cannot change the past, at least yet. Um, and it's, it will also be our primary source uh, of truth. So more technically, how we will represent events We'll see uh, uh, in a bit when we will do some coding. Uh, so an event uh, will have some data and some metadata. <clears throat> uh, the data will be an arbitrary uh, JSON uh, represented by a case class. So it will contain the, yeah, the event data, like the, when the user is created, for example, that will be the username. And then will be the metadata, for example, the type of the event. That typically uh, will be the name of the case class. Um, the ID of the event, the timestamp of the event, so when the event uh, actually happened. Um, aggregate type and ID. Each event, uh, in our case, will be associated to some kind of aggregate. Uh, so, for example, the user created event is, uh, will be associated to the user aggregate, right? What it, uh, it defines what the event is about, right? And each aggregate also has an ID, so this will be like a specific user ID, for example. Um, also, <clears throat> as we are doing transactions, we can have many events happening in a single transaction. So we may want to capture that information as well, um, that a couple of events happened in a single transaction. So we will store the transaction ID, and also we can store user ID. So that's the ID of the currently logged in user who actually did the change. So how are we going to do that? So events will be stored in a dedicated uh, table, uh, in a dedicated SQL table. Um, now, basing on these events, a read, we will maintain a read model. So the read model will be updated only in reaction to an incoming event. Um, and the read model, as the name suggests, will be used to uh, satisfy any read queries. Right? So if, if we, want, if we uh, want to read anything from our application, we'll use the read, we'll query the read model using SQL. Right? 
Um, and it's, it's uh, kind of similar, uh, the, the read model can be kind of similar to what a traditional CRUD model could be, uh, could be but uh, we have uh, kind of more freedom to denormalize it more if we want to, like we don't, uh, we can uh, recreate it at any point in time, right? And we can uh, also add new read models if we want to basing on past events. So we are not so constrained to not to, not to duplicate data uh, as in a normal CRUD application. Um, and quite importantly for consistency, uh, both uh, when, when, when doing a change, uh, both writing the event in the events table and updating the read model will be done in a single transaction. So that way the read model will be consistent with what's in the events table. And as you probably <coughs> suspected, we will be using Slick for actually <coughs> talking to the database. So I won't go into a very in-depth Slick introduction, but uh, in Slick, there's a <coughs> special data type defined, DBIO action. And um, using that type, uh, like that type describes uh, an operation on a database. So whenever you insert or you query a, a database, um, you invoke some operations on, on, uh, on the slick object, you don't really, <clears throat> the operation isn't really executed, you only get back a description of what will be done, okay? Uh, so for example, it's a description of how to insert uh, a new row into a table or how to query. Now, uh, you can then run such a description and th this will actually go to the database and perform the operations, okay? Why is this nice? where we can take a bunch of such, des of such des descriptions, compose them together into one big description. For example, say dot transactional, and they will all be run in a single transaction, okay? So these pieces can be, com uh, can be produced by uh, unrelated methods, um, and uh, they don't have to know anything about each, each, each other, they don't have to know anything about the transaction context or anything li like that. It's just a method which produces a description of how to talk to the database. And we can sequence these descriptions using a flat map, so this forms a, a monad or almost a monad, but that's not really that important. Okay, so now we will do some <coughs> live coding. So I will be using a library called um, Slick Event Sourcing. Um, it's a very small library. It's in, I'm not even sure I can call it a library. It's uh, presentation mode. Uh, I would say, so here it is. <clears throat> I would say it's more like an application template, so I would expect for any more serious usage you would end up probably forking it and changing it. But there's quite little code in there. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, uh, li little enough to type it all in here. Uh, but, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll show you uh, some parts of it. Okay, <clears throat> so what will we uh, be coding? So uh, our example application, uh, our example application will be, uh, so we will be, we will we'll create a very simple application to order uh, Tesla uh, cars, Tesla three models, it's quite a fashionable thing to do, everybody ordered one I guess already, so we will order one as well. So uh, the events coming into our system uh, will be Tesla orders, and uh, we want to maintain a list of current orders. And because <coughs> the, uh, the supply is quite limited, we are uh, imposing a limit of one per person. So we will be storing a name of the person who ordered the car, and we only want to allow one person to order one car. Okay? So that's, our, uh, that's the sequel to create our read model. Right, our read model has an order stable. It has, each order has an ID, and the name of the person ordering it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's quite simple. Now, analysts can go and query that and to find out how many Tesla orders have there been and, and so on. Uh, the second part of the SQL model will be the events table. So that's more or less what I've shown on the slide. There's the event ID uh, over here. There's the uh, serialized case class uh, to uh, JSON, uh, we have the type, so that's the name of the case class. Uh, we have the timestamp, 
and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, also, what I have uh, already written here is a mapping of the of this table, of the order table, right, uh, to slick. So here's the mapping. Uh, you can see that uh, we, can, we have a class orders and it's mapped to the orders table. And here are the field mappings, right, the ID and the name. And we have four operations defined. Uh, we have a find all operation. It's a DB action which returns a list of orders. Okay, a single order, that's the, mapped, uh, that's the mapped class, right? So this corresponds to a row in, a, in our read model. And <clears throat> so we have a method which returns a description how to find all of the orders. Here's a method which returns a description how to find a single order for, the, for, a, for a given person. Okay, we will, get, we will, we will be using that in a, uh, in a second. Uh, okay, so uh, we are building the event sourcing system, uh, the event source system, so we need uh, some point of entry into our system. So net point of entry will be a command, uh, class commands. We'll have a single command for now, and it will be place order uh, and name string. So, <clears throat> of course, we will be exposing this as a REST API, but the REST API has to uh, invoke our command, uh, has to invoke the business logic somehow, and it will do so through a command. Okay, so we have a, uh, we have a place order command, and where we kind of expect what, what, what does it have to do. So what can be the result type of a command? Okay, so well, the command uh, can either complete successfully or fail because of validation errors, right? So we can expect that the, that the result type should be either uh, some failure type uh, or some success type, right? Uh, so, uh, but then during the validation, we probably also read from the database. So we wrap that into a DB IO action, right? So that's our next candidate for the result type of the method. But then uh, during, like if, if, if the validation passed, it's quite possible that we also want to emit a couple of events. Right, so the result should be probably something like DBIO action, uh, and we want to return either the success or failure description and a list of events. Okay, so that's the result, uh, that's the desired result type. Uh, and uh, we already have that defined in the library I mentioned, it's called command result. It reads nicer than the long type that I wrote before. Uh, so as a failure type, we'll return a string, and as a success, a unit. And if we go to see the definition, you can see that it's a type alias, and it's more or less what I've written uh, in the comment, right? It's a DBIO action, so we can read from the database uh, as part of validating the data, and we return either a success or a failure value, plus a list of events. Here's a partial event. Uh, because uh, the events that we are, will be constructing by hand won't have all the metadata filled yet. Okay, so we have the, uh, our command. Um, so, 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 uh, what do we need to do? First, we need to validate the data, so we will check if the person already ordered a Tesla or not. So we will uh, add a parameter here, Tesla order model. Mm, so we do a Tesla order model, find by name. Uh, and the given name, and we flat map. Now, <clears throat> if, the, if that person already ordered a Tesla, uh, then we uh, return a failed uh, result, command result dot failed. It's simply a left on the either side. Uh, you've already ordered one. Okay, and in case, uh, in case there's no order for that person yet, we have to emit an event. So we'll create an event. Now, <clears throat> to create an event, we actually need a way to describe the event. So let's add, let's add that. So we'll create a new event, case class, Tesla ordered for the person called name. So <clears throat> that will be our event, right? It's, it's a simple case class. 
it's in past tense, right? It says that a Tesla has been ordered for the given person. So we create that event. We wrap it in an event class. I'll say what's that in a second. Tesla ordered for the name. Uh, yeah. Oh, Tesla, not Tesla. Okay. So now <clears throat> that's our payload. And the, the event uh, actually adds some metadata to it, right? The ID, the uh, aggregate type, which is uh, the event type, which is guessed from the uh, class tag and so on. And we also say that it's a for new aggregate, so we auto-generate an aggregate ID. And now we return the result. So we return the command result successful, unit plus an event. So now <clears throat> we have an, a command which takes in some user data and returns uh, both a success or failure value and a list of events to emit. It, to, to emit. And also we can do some de database operations uh, as uh, during the validation phase, right? Um, okay, but like we didn't really do anything in the database yet, right? We just returned, uh, we just returned the event itself. Okay, we'll wire all things uh, in a second. Let's now think what should happen when the event actually is handled by the system. So first of all, we have event listeners. And we will need an implicit execution context here because you need it always everywhere. <clears throat> so an event listener is a, uh, that's where the main business logic is. And an event listener describes what should happen uh, when an event <clears throat> is, uh, is, uh, is uh, triggered. Event listeners are meant to be run only once when the event happens. And they can run some side effects. For example, we want to send an email to the customer confirming the order. So we create an event listener, send customer notification. It will be an event listener for the Tesla ordered. Um, Tesla ordered event. Now what's this type event listener? Again, it's a, it's a very simple type. It's type alias. It's a function. It's a function which takes an event with payload of type T and returns a DBIO action. So we can touch the database. We can read from the database and we can emit some, some more events. Okay, but we won't do that now. Um, also what's very nice and slick and what we are using here is you probably know that it has three type parameters, right? That's the type of the, that's the, re the result type of what's the result of the computation. But here we also can control if we can read to the, uh, from the database or uh, also write. So an event listener can only read from the database. It cannot write the database, right? It's, it can only read data from the read model. Um, and, and, okay. Uh, so uh, our event listener is a function, so we take in the event. So that's the event of, uh, with the payload Tesla ordered. And what we will do, we will send email service, send email, your Tesla Model 3 will be ready in a couple of years. Right. Um, so that's like, a, let's say this sends an email. It has a, it actually only writes to the console, but let's say it sends an email. It, re it returns a future. Now we need to convert this future into a DBIO action. And we luckily have a method for that. So we do a DBIO action dot from. And this converts a future to a DBIO uh, action. Okay, and we are not emitting an event. So we are mapping the unit result to an empty list of events. Okay, so that's an event listener that we want to be triggered whenever our event happens. And that's like kind of the side effects. Now we also need another kind of, uh, of listener which actually updates the uh, read model. So what we need is we need a model updates class. Tesla order model. Okay, and we will have an order ordered update, which is a model update, another uh, type alias, which we will show in a second. Tesla ordered. And now a model update, it's again a type alias, it's a function, 
it's a, it's a simple function, right? It's uh, uh, no, 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 nothing very complicated. You don't have to extend anything. It's, it's a simple Scala function. It takes in an event with payload t and returns a description uh, of how to update the read model. Notice that we can both read and write here to the database, right? Um, okay, so it uh, will be quite a simple thing to do. Uh, when we take in the event, we take the Tesla order model and we insert a new row. And the new row will be a Tesla order. Uh, the ID of the, uh, of the row in the read model will be the aggregate ID. Uh, and the name will be e.data.name. That's the name from the event. And there's no additional equipment. Okay, so now we have a way to update, uh, update our read model. Now we need some, ki some kind of way to tie it all together. Okay, we need some kind of registry which, which says that when an event happens, these events listeners should be run and these model updates should be run. Right? All that we have done so far is write some loose functions and we need to get them together. So that's where the registry comes in. So using the registry, uh, let me just change here. Okay. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to create instances of the commands, new commands, and the parameter here is Tesla order model. Uh, we need an instance of event listeners and we need an instance of model updates. Mm. Okay. Now we have a registry that also comes from, from the library, but it's a simple map from, it's like multiple maps from event type to event listeners, model updates has methods like register event listener and we pass in the function, right? We pass in the function from event uh, listeners dot send customer notification. And we also register a model update, model updates dot ordered update, okay? We line it up nicely. Okay, so we now have the registry. So now the last piece of the puzzle that's missing, we need some kind of method which takes in the registry, right? takes in a command result, failure success. So we have the registry, we have the command result which describes us how to produce the events, right? So we need now to actually write the events to the events table, to run the event listeners, run the model updates, and return us a future uh, either failure success, okay? And that future, when that future is complete, we expect to have everything, the transaction complete, everything in the database. The read model updated the events in, in, the, uh, in the database. And that's already <coughs> uh, written in the, in the library and mentioned there's an, an event machine, which uh, among other things, which you don't have to worry about right now, takes in a, re uh, it takes in a registry, it has a run method, uh, which takes a command result, right? And returns the future that I mentioned. Okay, and we will use that in our HTTP routes to actually run, uh, run the result of the command result. Okay, so, 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 uh, now let's wire things up to actually see it working. So here I have a very simple routes, uh, HTTP, uh, ACA HTTP uh, routes uh, to place an order and list orders. Uh, so we will need some, uh, to pass in some parameters to these routes. We need the events database. We need the event machine, which I mentioned. We need the Tesla order model and the commands. Okay. So now, first, when we uh, want to list orders, uh, what we need to do is we need to first uh, get the Tesla order model. So we will want to display on the, on the web page a list of all orders currently placed. Uh, so we get the Tesla order model uh, dot find all and uh, now we want to wait for that so we, we need to run it because uh, now that's only a description of how to read all the orders so we need to run that so we run events database dot db dot run and now we have to wait when that's complete so there's a directive for waiting for a future 
and we get a list of orders and we complete with the orders dot map its name and it will be a simple uh, mcal string okay yeah. And no. And I missed something on success. On success. Okay. Yeah. And now over here we accept a new order, right? Uh, we that's a, that's a post endpoint. We get the data from the body. The data from the body is the name of the person who ordered. So now what we do is we uh, create our command, place order, but it's only a description of what events should be emitted, right? So we need to run that using the event machine, let's run. And again, we use on success to unwrap the future. And uh, when we get an error, uh, we, we, we complete using status codes Bad. There's no bad request. And the error. Mm, and if there's no error, then we complete. Okay. So <clears throat> we create a description of how to, of which events should be produced. We uh, run it through the event machine, which actually persists the events and does the changes to the read model and runs the event listeners. And we then return the result to the user. So now let's try to compile it. There will be uh, for sure some errors. Yes, of course. So we are missing parameters here. Events uh, database and event machine and Tesla order model and commands. So we need to instantiate that. Uh, ah, okay, so here <coughs> we need uh, a way to uh, add some metadata to the event uh, saying which order uh, was that, so we need uh, to specify the, the aggregate for that event, so the compiler has no way of knowing that. So one way of doing that is in the companion object, you can create an implicit aggregate for event marker object, Tesla ordered is for the Tesla order. So here we specify that the Tesla ordered event is uh, the, the, the aggregate for the Tesla ordered event is the Tesla order class and an execution context, of course. Implicit. I'm sure you'll spend <coughs> your time on fixing bugs like that as well. Okay. So now uh, let's just me quickly remove the old data. No. Okay, and now we can run, run this thing, main. Okay, so that's running, and now we can go to localhost 8080, and we can place our orders, so uh, we can say for me, for example, nothing happened. It should happen, of course. For some reason, it doesn't work. But for that case, I have another class ready here. I must have mistyped something. So that's almost the same code that's running now, but it's working. No, it's not. Would you believe me? It always worked. It always worked before. Well, anyway. What you should see, what you should see is uh, some information getting logged here about the event being persisted and the, re and the model being updated. Uh, and the list, of course, being updated. Um, so, why doesn't this work? Because I'm not doing a post. Adam, no. Well, anyway, it always works. Uh, so, getting back over here. Uh, so, what are the uh, potential uh, problems with such approach? So, first of all, the ordering of uh, concurrent events 
uh, operating on the same aggregate root might be problematic. Uh, if you have a couple of events coming in at the same time and they, uh, and they are for the same uh, aggregate root instance or so for the same ID, so you can get a different order of them being applied in a real system and a different order when you, re when you replay. So uh, there are some ways, of course, to fix that, either by using pessimistic or optimistic locking. Uh, whether you want to do that or not, it really you know, depends on, on, uh, on your use case. Um, also, some people don't like that the debio action kind of leaks quite high into your, uh, into your code base. So, uh, but you can think of it as a, non -fe as a, as a feature, actually, uh, because then you know that the code that, 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 that you have, it, that it actually touches the database. Right? So maybe that's a good thing to know. Um, Another problem is the way you can wrap futures uh, from a DBIO action. It's not really perfect because it's, run, it's wrapping an already running future. So it's not really, when you wrap a future with a DBIO action, it's not really a description of a computation, it's a running computation. But these are like probably more minor points. Um, okay, so summing up, in the approach I have shown, we have three main uh, functions involved. Uh, so and these are, these are uh, quite, uh, simple functions, you don't uh, need uh, much like scaffolding to, uh, to build that. So we have the commands. A command takes in some user data, validates it, returns a success or failure result, plus a list of events. Then you have another function which takes an event, uh, the, the, the event listeners, which takes an event and returns, but does some side effects, like sending an email, um, and it returns a list of more events which can be emitted. And you have the model updates uh, function, which, uh, which actually uh, updates our read model. And these are the, the, the main distinction between the event listeners and the model updates is that you can run, uh, you can rerun the model updates multiple times to bring your model to a certain point in time, while the event listeners should be probably only run once, right, when the event actually happens, because that's where the side effects happen. Um, here are some links. So uh, the library that I've used, Slick Event Sourcing, is open source. Uh, as I said, it's, uh, the code is quite short. Probably the readme and the blog, which is described functionality, are longer than the code. Uh, it's only a skeleton, and uh, as I mentioned, the, the slides, uh, the material that I use here in a working uh, form, hopefully, is also on GitHub. And uh, that's, uh, that's everything that I had. Uh, so once again, uh, please remember to rate the sessions. It's very valuable input both for the organizers and for the presenters, so for me. So please do that. And if you have any questions, I'm either here now or to the end of the conference and even a couple of days later if you will be looking for me in New York. So any questions? Yeah. Um, we usually use tries for error handling instead of either's. Do you see a, a way we could um, still use your library? Uh, if you want to use a try for failure handling, mm, I guess it's a kind of a different failures, right? Because uh, in a try, uh, that's when you want to capture uh, some exception. And I, I'm not sure if, if uh, you use exceptions for data validation as well. We, we normally do, yeah. Um, well, one thing that uh, you can do is, as I said, well, it is, an, it is a template so you can customize it, uh, but the DBIO action also has a failed state, I think, so maybe you can use that to propagate the errors and, and match on that, uh, although the exception would be rest then, uh, so the future would be failed. Um, uh, okay, I, w I would have to think about it, so maybe we can talk uh, after talk. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, then thank you very much and enjoy the conference.